Let's begin with the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue. The United States is showing an increased role and interest in this dialogue. What new dimensions do diplomats Matthew Palmer and Richard Grenell give to this process? Well, as you know, Honor, we've been supportive of uh, the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue uh, since its beginnings. Uh, we supported the European Union's effort. We've tried to be a partner in that, that effort. Uh, and I think the Secretary of State, uh, Secretary Pompeo, demonstrated by uh, elevating Matthew Palmer, one of my deputy assistant secretaries, to be the special representative for the Western Balkans, uh, pointed directly to uh, that, the, the focus that we have on the region. And uh, President Trump supported that by uh, appointing our ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, uh, as a, a special presidential envoy for Serbia. Kosovo peace negotiations to add a political dimension to indicate uh, that we believe this is an important process and that the United States will do what we can to help that process. You have long time been involved in the mediation process between Kosovo and Serbia. How real are the chances for these two countries to reach a peaceful agreement? Well, we believe that the chances are real. We believe there is a will on both sides. Most importantly, there's a, a broad desire for all the people in the region uh, to live peacefully, uh, to find um, ways to move forward uh, with a, uh, a view towards integrating more fully into uh, European and transatlantic institutions uh, and to finding ways to uh, better deliver security, uh, stability and prosperity to all the people of the region. And I believe uh, that is what the leaders uh, both in Serbia and in Kosovo uh, want to see happen. It's a question of finding the right dynamic, finding the ability to move forward, and that's what diplomacy is all about. For more than a year now, the idea of border change has been widely talked in Kosovo. How realistic is to expect Kosovo and Serbia to agree on a new border? Well, I think they need to look at what they can do to, to move forward rather than uh, going with any preconceived notions of what uh, a broader peace agreement may be. What how can they recognize each other? How can they uh, work uh, to find better opportunities for their people? And that includes the economic opportunities that would come from resolving certain differences, uh, from looking at ways to, uh, to increase trade and opportunity and attract outside investment into the region more broadly. That's what the future uh, holds for all of these people, and that's what the United States wants to support. Uh, what the two countries can do together uh, to find a way forward without preconditions. Does the United States support this idea of border change? The United States supports the two countries working together uh, through dialogue to find uh, a way forward out of this which will present better opportunities for the people in Serbia, the people in Kosovo, through the whole region and frankly that is good for Europe and then it is good uh, in our view for our broader uh, transatlantic uh, family of nations uh, to be able to proceed in a, in a more uh, stable, more secure situation. And again, this is about the future of, uh, of uh, all the people in the region and the generations to come. But are you concerned about the warnings that a possible change of border between Kosovo and Serbia could have a domino effect in the region? Again, I think you're obsessing on uh, ideas of changes of borders. That's not what uh, we're focused on here. We're focused on the two countries finding ways forward and to preconceive notions of uh, what may be uh, a way to find a resolution uh, to establish this uh, is not the way uh, to go about doing that. Uh, and I really think it's an excuse uh, by others not to proceed when they focus on uh, things that they imagine beforehand. Uh, a negotiation is, is a negotiation and that's what dialogue is about. Sitting down and talking about opportunities, uh, building confidence between the two countries. And that's why we have offered our diplomatic offices a special representative, uh, you know, a special presidential envoy to help bridge that uh, and hopefully work with our European uh, colleagues and counterparts to move the entire process and the region forward uh, for a better future for everyone there. Mr. Riker, there are speculation for a kind of uh, peace conference between Kosovo and Serbia organized by the United States. Is Washington planning something like that? I'm not aware of any specific plans. Again, it's up to the, the two sides to see what they can do uh, to work on together. 
Uh, we've just had elections recently in uh, Kosovo. We're waiting for the final formation of a government there. That's clearly an important step uh, in a process forward. Uh, the, the dialogue process uh, has been very important uh, in the past in helping resolve certain issues, and we want to see uh, both countries get back uh, to the table together, back to dialogue. Can we expect any meeting in Washington? Uh, I'm not aware of any meetings in Washington now. I, I have plenty of meetings in Washington all the time. <laughs> what the two sides need to do is decide how they can move forward, and we're offering uh, our good, uh, good offices uh, and the support uh, of American diplomacy, which we uh, want to do with the European Union, uh, and of course the two countries to move forward on an agenda that they have both set as priorities. It seems a bit hypothetical, but if the deal is blocked, what would be the consequences of a continuing kind of status quo in the relations between Kosovo and Serbia? Well, I think, uh, first of all, as you yourself said, this is hypothetical. So why we spend a lot of time talking about mm -hmm. hypotheticals? Uh, if there's no deal, then you stay in the status quo and you don't move forward. You continue to have instability in a region uh, that needs more stability. Uh, you continue to uh, uh, let history uh, drive uh, the future instead of looking at the future uh, and trying to shape uh, a new history for the region which we believe is, is very much possible. I think uh, it's time uh, to move ahead to find ways uh, that uh, the people in Kosovo, the people in Serbia, the people throughout uh, the Western Balkans uh, can have more, sta more stability uh, and therefore more opportunities for uh, prosperity. To do that, you've got to have security. It's important uh, that the peoples of the region uh, recognize uh, that they need to live together. The geography is a reality. Neighbors are neighbors, uh, and that's not going to change. Uh, it's about finding a way to move forward uh, and take advantage of uh, what's being offered in terms of international support to find uh, solutions and, uh, and progress in uh, this long-standing dispute. Let's move to another issue now, Bosnia and Herzegovina. This country has spent a year without a state government now. How can Bosnia become a functioning state? Well, I think it's important uh, that the people of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, be listened to by their leaders. They're elected to, to govern, to uh, bring functionality, f functionality to, uh, to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. You know, it's almost 25 years uh, since the Dayton Accords uh, brought peace to an absolutely horrible situation. I think people may have forgotten just how awful uh, the war in Bosnia was. Uh, there in really the heart of Europe, you had a terrible war. You had so many deaths, uh, so many atrocities, uh, mass uh, exodus and migration. Uh, we found uh, a road to peace through the Dayton process. And now, 25 years later, it is really time to move forward uh, and make a more functional state. That's the obligation of the leaders uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, all of them. And uh, certainly that's what the United States uh, supports. Uh, and we want to, again, work with our European partners uh, to help promote that. Yeah, you just mentioned the Dayton Agreement. And as you said, it was a major American contribution to the peace. How would you comment on the calls for changing it? Well, the Dayton Agreement was, uh, was brought into force to bring peace, to, to end that horrible war. It was never meant to be a permanent uh, situation. Uh, what we need is a will uh, you know, on, on all sides in Bosnia and Herzegovina to look at uh, what you can do to not only make the country more functional, uh, but to offer more stability, uh, more security more uh, prosperity. That's, again, what the people want. And we think uh, moving forward on the, the types of reforms that the international community have encouraged, taking advantage of uh, the goodwill and support that Bosnia and Herzegovina has from uh, so many friends and partners, uh, pushing back against the malign influences that like to see uh, disruption in the region, uh, that's an important step. And that's what our diplomacy is focused on. Next year will be an election year in North Macedonia. The decision for these elections has been made 
after the European Council refused to open the accession talks with uh, Skopje and Tirana earlier this month, what would be your message to Macedonian public and political parties there? Well, North Macedonia has made enormous progress. Uh, in the United States, we were very pleased last week to see the United States Senate ratify fully North Macedonia's uh, application to join as a full member of NATO. And indeed, Macedonia, North Macedonia will be the 30th uh, member, the 30th ally of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So that's an enormous step. They've undertaken great reforms. Uh, they've entered into agreements with neighbors that have allowed them to, to move forward to this. Uh, we've already seen uh, results in North Macedonia in terms of a, of a renewed sense of uh, stability and security, which increases uh, opportunities and interest from foreign investors. Uh, that is important. We were disappointed. Uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, made that very clear uh, that uh, the European Council could not move forward to begin the accession talks, both for North Macedonia and for Albania. Uh, the European perspective, uh, the idea that uh, the peoples of Europe, uh, these European countries, want to join the European Union has been a, a key component of our foreign policy. We are not members of the European Union, obviously, um, but we have supported that ideal and our assistance programs uh, our, uh, our diplomacy have all supported the reform efforts uh, that these countries have undertaken to move in that direction because we feel that's in the best interest of the countries, the region, and of Europe. And it's disappointing to see certain leaders uh, with a sort of 19th century view of, uh, of the Western Balkan region. Uh, and we hope that that's uh, just a temporary uh, impediment that uh, the countries will have an opportunity in the spring, as they said, to then uh, have a new decision that would allow the, uh, the accession talks to open. That, of course, is just the beginning of a long process, a series of chapters uh, that uh, those countries, just as uh, new member states of the European Union, have gone before them uh, in implementing the necessary reforms to meet, uh, meet the qualifications, to, to meet the requirements of EU membership. And uh, I note that uh, the Council did not require new steps. They simply deferred the decision. Uh, and we're hopeful that that's uh, what that will be. I know in North Macedonia, they've taken great steps in this direction. They've, uh, they're pleased to see the, the progress uh, in the NATO process. We will be um, obviously recognizing that as the NATO leadership meets uh, in December. Uh, and we'll continue to support their efforts, uh, both in North Macedonia and in Albania, uh, to move forward on the EU track as well. But do you think this negative uh, decision by Brussels could have a negative effects in the region or open the doors to other countries? Well, I do think uh, it's important that uh, this process, which the European Union and, and its member states have encouraged now for decades, uh, should not be suddenly seen as thrown into, thrown into doubt. Uh, these are European countries, and the United States has supported the ideal of a Europe whole, free, and at peace and prosperous uh, as part of our foreign policy uh, now, uh, really since, uh, since the end of World War II. Uh, we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of NATO. NATO has clearly been an important key to bringing uh, stability. Uh, first to Western Europe through the period of the Cold War and then as NATO adapted to uh, the post-Cold War era, took in new members uh, and, and th those who aspire to NATO membership, uh, expanding partnerships with others as a, as a defensive uh, alliance. Uh, that has been an important key to uh, having a level of security which has allowed this unprecedented era of prosperity uh, throughout Europe. That's something that we're proud of. That's good for the United States. That's certainly good for Europeans. Uh, and as we celebrate these anniversaries uh, and uh, commemorate what we've gone through together, uh, we believe that uh, we need to keep on that track. There are those who would interfere in, uh, in the countries of the Western Balkans simply to cause instability. Uh, there are those who don't want to see uh, stability come because it affects uh, their uh, more negative interests. And so uh, 
we will continue to stand with the peoples of the region uh, as they want to move forward for better futures. Uh, uh, Mr. Palmer said last week that uh, lack of decision for North Macedonia and Albania could open the doors to Russia. Are you concerned? I think uh, that's exactly uh, a concern. Uh, we have seen uh, the malign influence before uh, in terms of, of how that has affected things uh, in the region. Um, look, these countries have clearly stated that the direction they want to go is is West. They are part of Europe and they want to be a part of the institutions and organizations uh, that uh, make up Europe and allow for greater prosperity, greater cohesion. Uh, they've made great strides uh, in settling differences with their neighbors. Uh, that's a first step in taking the necessary reforms uh, to qualify, simply to open the accession process, which will then, of course, uh, take longer as each of these chapters is done, but that, that's a positive process. And uh, we believe that uh, they deserve a positive answer after doing exactly what they were asked to do uh, and meeting the criteria necessary to, to move ahead. According to you, where is the biggest Russian influence in the region? Well, I mean, that's uh, sort of up to others' uh, views, uh, how they want to, to view that. Um, Russia uh, is a country that uh, has relations in the region uh, and, and of course we recognize that. We want to have better relations with Russia as well. Um, I've been to Moscow and tried to uh, talk to uh, counterparts there about uh, where we can uh, try to build our relationship, but we have a lot of uh, challenges. I think one of the most obvious places uh, most broadly where the Russian malign influence is seen is in Ukraine where uh, Russia has invaded a country, has occupied a country, has continued to keep a hot war going in the eastern part of, of Ukraine. Thousands of people have died. They have undertaken obligations through uh, the Minsk process to, uh, to uh, um, find a way forward uh, and have not lived up to those proposals. That's what we want to see happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Russians are paying a price for that. Uh, the actions of their government, but certainly uh, Ukrainians are. And that kind of malign influence is something we don't want to see uh, in, in other parts of, of Europe, certainly not in the Western Balkans. And what about Chinese influence in the Balkans? Well, China is also a, a challenge, a, a strategic competitor uh, that comes into countries uh, offering often uh, uh, cheap money, loans, uh, that then come with strings attached. and. Uh, we say to all of our friends and, uh, and partners uh, that you have to be uh, careful about uh, where you go uh, in the direction of this when it comes to things like uh, technology infrastructure, um, 5G question, uh, what kind of, uh, of future do you want to have in terms of the infrastructure of your modern technology, the ability of, uh, of countries to collect data. Uh, what does that mean for f your future? So we mm -hmm. uh, share with our friends uh, and partners exactly the kind of concerns we've developed in our own country uh, and uh, suggest it's important to think about that very carefully going forward. This is why we see uh, these countries throughout the Western Balkans that uh, want to be part of the West, want to be part mm -hmm. of Europe, uh, having taken steps now over a period of uh, many years, decades in fact, uh, to integrate more uh, with their European partners. Uh, we want to support that. Mr. Riker, apart from the Balkans now, how concerned are you about the circumstances behind Ambassador Jovanovic's dismissal? Well, I think that's something that uh, has been dealt with uh, in, in our country. Uh, we have a, a new uh, charge d'affaires in uh, at our embassy in, in Kiev since Ambassador Yovanovitch finished uh, her tour. Uh, she is still a member of the Foreign Service and an active uh, diplomat in our service. So uh, I think there needs to be a little clarity on that. Uh, it's something that's being discussed, uh, um, uh, obviously, in Washington at, at this time. Um, and we continue to focus on our policy in Ukraine the importance of engagement there. I see that the Secretary General of NATO uh, is visiting Ukraine today, has just spoken to the Ukrainian parliament. 
that's important. The Ukrainian people have stated very clearly the direction that they want to go. And we stand by Ukraine in supporting its sovereignty, its independence, and calling for a withdrawal of Russian troops that are occupying major parts of the country and continuing to, uh, to promote a hot war there. And how concerned are you about the military delay? about the delay to the military aid to Ukraine and the idea that it was, in fact, a quid pro quo. Our military aid to Ukraine is ongoing. It is, uh, it is active now, and uh, that's what's important. We are delivering uh, strong military aid and support to Ukraine uh, to defend itself against the type of Russian aggression that we've just talked about.